In the soft glow of the hospital room, surrounded by the hum of medical machines, Thomas sauntered in with a smug grin. Looks like you can't even manage the simple house chores. Maybe we should just call it quits, he jeered, oblivious to the gravity of my situation, tethered to life-saving equipment. Beside him stood a girl, unfamiliar to me, witnessing the scene unfold. Little did Thomas realize, I had amassed a fortune worth $10 million, and for someone in my position, a housewife by his narrow definition, this divorce wasn't just about separation, it was a battle for survival. I contemplated silently. The disdain I felt for a man who could ridicule his wife in such a vulnerable state was overwhelming. Reaching into my bag, I retrieved the divorce papers I had preemptively prepared for an occasion just like this. Handing them to Thomas with a defiant smile, I said, consider this my parting gift. Thomas took the papers nonchalantly. Well, I'm moving on with her. You'll be all right, he remarked casually, draping his arm around the girl, whom he introduced as Victoria. With a taunting look, she said, farewell, Mrs. Soon-to-be X. Take care, ma'am. As they exited the room, laughter echoed behind them, a sound stark against my solitude. Yet, I couldn't help but chuckle to myself. Today was Friday, and by Monday, the divorce would be finalized. The anticipation of a new beginning was thrilling. My name is Eleanor, a 40-year-old from a humble farming background, with no special skills to speak of, yet I took immense pride in my extensive culinary skills. Thomas and I were college sweethearts who had ventured to Oklahoma City from our rural roots. Living on our own, I loved preparing meals for him, using the fresh produce my family sent over. It was often said that I had won his heart through his stomach, and I believed it. Thomas had never been adept at household tasks, a role I had naturally filled since our dating days and throughout our marriage. Although childless, we had shared many joyful moments as a couple, often driving out on his days off to indulge in the culinary delights of various locales. In the early years, Thomas was a gentle soul, but time saw him change into a controlling partner. He never resorted to physical aggression, but his cutting remarks grew frequent and harsh. Despite the hurt, I rarely confronted him, doubting he would heed my words given my role as a full-time housewife. After college, Thomas landed a position at a prestigious company but eventually resigned. His attitude had shifted significantly by then, and our dynamic strained under his critical eye and my growing sense of inadequacy. Yet, through it all, I held on to my dignity and my secret fortune, ready to reclaim my life the moment the opportunity arose. And now, as I lay in that hospital room, that moment had finally come. After about five years into our marriage, Thomas had become accustomed to changing jobs frequently. He would quickly land new positions but would just as swiftly resign from them, leaving our financial situation precarious and unstable. However, for the last three years, he seemed to have found a groove with his current company, fitting in well with his colleagues. This gave me a glimmer of hope that he might finally settle into a long-term role. Then, one day, Thomas returned home unexpectedly early. As he walked through the door, he casually announced, I'm home. I quit my job. What? Again? I blurted out before I could stop myself, my surprise making his eyebrows twitch in annoyance. Realizing I might have sparked his temper, I quickly abandoned my cooking and went to him. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to sound critical. It was just unexpected, I explained, hoping to diffuse the tension. No welcome back? Straight to criticism. You're quite bold today, Thomas snapped back, his voice sharp and cold. At his words, I tensed, recognizing his foul mood could easily worsen. I'm sorry, I replied softly, trying to placate him. As long as you understand, he grumbled, slightly mollified by my apology. He then moved to the sofa and turned on the TV, sinking into his usual routine of disconnecting from everything else. I set a beer and a glass on the coffee table near him, then asked quietly, do you want dinner, or would you prefer a bath first? Food and alcohol, he responded bluntly. To keep the peace, I resumed my role as the accommodating wife, a role I had mastered over the past 16 years since marrying Thomas at the age of 30. My once vibrant personality had dimmed, 
and I rarely allowed my true feelings to surface. After Thomas had his fill of dinner and drinks, his mood improved slightly, and he eventually dozed off on the sofa, snoring loudly. The chaos on the table made it look as though a storm had passed through, with beer bottles and food scraps strewn about. As I began cleaning up, I couldn't help but reflect on how far removed this scene was from the life I had envisioned as a young, hopeful woman in love. Glancing at Thomas, who showed no sign of waking soon, a sense of relief washed over me. However, this was quickly followed by a creeping dread about continuing to live this way. Perhaps considering a divorce wasn't just a fleeting thought anymore. As I cleaned, I began mentally preparing for the next day, resolved to start addressing the issues I had long avoided. Meanwhile, Thomas would likely visit the employment office again, quickly securing another job as I ventured into the city to reclaim parts of the life I had put on hold. In the midst of our tumultuous marriage, I found a semblance of security by preparing divorce papers. Although I wasn't ready to file them just yet, simply having them signed and hidden away at the bottom of my daily use bag felt like a necessary shield. If Thomas ever stumbled upon them, I could only imagine his reaction. Where did you go while I was out job hunting? Thomas questioned as soon as I walked through the door. I popped into the stationery store to pick up some resume paper, I replied, hoping to divert his attention. I thought you might need them. That day, Thomas's demeanor was unusually contemplative. He started with a suspicious tone but seemed to lighten up when I handed him the resumes I had bought. After accepting them, he casually mentioned he was going out for drinks with a friend and swiftly left. His new job, he had told me earlier, was with a reputable company that offered a solid salary and better benefits than he had before. I clung to a faint hope that maybe this job would be the one he'd keep until retirement, especially since he seemed to fit well in the regional sales manage and started spending more evenings out. I treasured these moments of solitude, using them to rejuvenate and always managed to greet Thomas with a smile upon his return. Then, one day, I received an unexpected call from my mother. Her voice brimmed with excitement as she disclosed a sudden financial windfall. You know the mountain land we owned? We don't need it anymore. It's been appraised at $12 million, and we only need $3 million for ourselves. You should consider what this means for your life, she advised. My mother had never been fond of Thomas, particularly as his controlling nature worsened, even preventing me from visiting my childhood home. The news of the inheritance shocked me, not only because of the amount but also because she had transferred the property into my name to sidestep inheritance taxes. I was torn about whether to disclose this newfound fortune to Thomas or to seize it as a chance for a fresh start. About a week after this revelation, I was involved in a traffic accident. Thankfully, my life wasn't in danger, but I would need to be hospitalized for a week. After securing my valuables in the hospital room drawer, including the signed divorce papers, I reached out to Thomas. I'm sorry, I started, preparing to navigate the complexities of our conversation and the decisions that lay ahead. After I informed Thomas about my accident, his first reaction was shockingly self-centered. Huh, what about my meals, he asked making me nearly lose my patience at his insensitivity. However, I managed to remain calm and explained further. I need to be hospitalized for a week. I'm really sorry, but you'll have to find meals elsewhere until then. Thomas's response was anything but sympathetic. Not even preparing meals for your husband? What a lazy wife, he scoffed. Oh, wait, I'm coming over now, he added before abruptly ending the call. I had initially planned to tell him about the inheritance that evening, but his reaction made me reconsider if I should reveal it at all. As I lay in the hospital bed, surrounded by medical equipment and undergoing tests, I sensed that my instincts about not sharing the financial windfall were correct. When Thomas arrived, his harsh words confirmed my decision. You're useless, can't even do housework. Let's get a divorce and you better pay me compensation, he said with a cruel smirk not realizing that I was connected to numerous medical devices. Standing beside him was a girl I didn't recognize. Oblivious to my assets worth $10 million, he continued to underestimate the stakes of our situation. 
Convinced now more than ever that I no longer wanted a life with him, I decided it was time to act. Fine, here are the divorce papers, I said, pulling them from my bag where they had been kept almost like a talisman. Thomas's smug expression as he took them only fueled my resolve. I can finally say goodbye to you. I'm going to be happy with her, he declared confidently, wrapping his arm around the girl he called Natalia. Natalia leaned against him and mockingly said to me, Take care, madam. Oh, you're not a madam anymore, take care old lady. They left the room laughing, thinking they had the upper hand, but their shallow joy did not bother me. Alone in my hospital room, I burst out laughing. It was Friday, and the divorce would be processed by Monday. I eagerly awaited those four days, anticipating my newfound freedom. The weekend passed quietly without any word from Thomas. It was peaceful, and I felt a deep sense of relief and excitement about beginning a new chapter in my life, free from his negativity and control. Restlessness engulfed me as I lay in the hospital bed, the inactivity was unlike anything I was used to. Whenever I felt the urge to move, the nurses gently reminded me to stay calm. By Monday evening, my phone began to incessantly ring with calls from Thomas. At first, I chose to ignore them, but after 25 minutes of relentless ringing, I decided to pick up. Stop calling me repeatedly, I urged as soon as I answered. Thomas's immediate shouting took me by surprise, but I couldn't help laughing, which only fueled his anger further. He was livid because the court hadn't accepted the divorce papers. Between chuckles, I informed him that I had previously filed a notice of non-acceptance. Remember how you used to casually bring up divorce during our arguments? I thought it wouldn't be fair to let you impulsively file during one of those spats, I explained. Thomas was irate but his tone soon shifted as he desperately wanted me to withdraw the non-acceptance. However, I was resolute in my new stance of not bending to his every whim. I can't do anything until I'm discharged and will need to handle this through proper channels at the municipal office," I told him, amused by his selfish demands. He seemed particularly frantic because he wanted to register his marriage with Victoria, the woman he had brought to the hospital on Friday. Is her name Andrew, and is she your mistress? I asked teasingly. Thomas corrected me, stating she was his new wife, and since we were still legally married, she was technically my mistress. This absurd exchange made me even more determined to stand my ground. I decided to hit back harder. You'll be hearing from my lawyer about the division of property, I stated, emphasizing the legal troubles ahead. I reminded him of my loyalty and diligence in our marriage, I had always managed the household and never strayed. It was clear that Thomas was the one at fault, not me. Thomas seemed genuinely confused thinking that my inability to take care of him while hospitalized was a failing on my part. I patiently explained that my current incapacity to do household chores did not constitute neglect on my end. You've abandoned your responsibilities towards me, I pointed out. Even if I were a child, this would be considered neglect. But I'm an adult, and you should be capable of taking care of yourself. My being in the hospital doesn't make me the one at fault. His twisted logic was bewildering, and I was certain that even a judge would find his reasoning absurd. As I lay in the hospital bed, my patience with Thomas was dwindling. He still clung to the belief that he was in the right, insisting that Natalia was now his wife and that I was no longer useful to him, hence my views didn't matter. I countered his claims by pointing out that his secret relationship with her constituted cheating, yet he seemed unfazed and continued to believe he was justified in his actions. Deciding enough was enough, I told him that any further communication should be done through our lawyers. I hung up the phone, cutting off his protests. Despite several more attempts from Thomas to reach me, I stood firm and ignored his calls, and eventually, he stopped trying. The respite was short-lived. The next day, my phone began ringing incessantly from the early morning. Thomas was on the other end, complaining that he couldn't withdraw money from a bank account. If it were truly a joint account, he shouldn't have faced any issues. Suspicious, I asked if he was trying to access my personal account. Thomas admitted he was indeed trying to take money from my funds. His audacity astounded me. Before my hospitalization, 
Anticipating potential issues, I had called the bank to prevent any withdrawals until I could oversee them personally upon my discharge. This precaution was to curb Thomas's careless spending of my savings while I was incapacitated, a decision I now knew was wise. It's not right for you to try to take money from your ex-wife's account, especially after a divorce, I firmly told him over the phone. However, Thomas didn't see it that way and demanded that I allow a withdrawal immediately. I reminded him sharply, we are practically strangers now, and I have no obligation to give money to strangers. Thomas was taken aback by my newfound assertiveness, having never seen me stand up to him in this manner before. He persisted, demanding that I send him money and even compensate for the housework I wasn't doing. It became evident that despite his education, Thomas lacked practical wisdom. After 15 years of marriage, I found myself addressing him as though he were a child, explaining the basic ethics of our situation and the legal boundaries now defining our interactions. His failure to grasp these concepts was disappointing but reinforced my decision to stand my ground. No longer the compliant wife he once knew, I was determined to handle the division of our property through legal channels. Thomas's frustration boiled over, and he threatened to visit me at the hospital immediately. I wasn't particularly bothered by the prospect of his arrival, as I had already instructed the nursing station to allow only my parents to visit me. Despite his threats, Thomas's attempts to see me were thwarted at the nurse's station, leaving him unable to reach my room. Meanwhile, my phone was bombarded with incessant calls, which I ignored, leading Thomas to switch to sending messages. My screen flooded with notifications, each one saved meticulously as potential evidence. Eventually, after contacting my lawyer, the relentless messages ceased, presumably due to my lawyer's intervention. Just as I thought the chaos was subsiding, an unexpected twist occurred. I received word of a visitor named Savannah, a longtime acquaintance who shared my passion for dining out. We had often enjoyed meals together before my marriage. Savannah, concerned about my injury, also brought startling news, she suspected that Natalia, the young woman with Thomas, was involved in an affair with him. Her connection to the situation was even more personal than I expected, Natalia turned out to be Savannah's niece. Savannah explained that Natalia had bragged to her sister, Savannah's mother, about marrying a 40-year-old man. When Savannah saw a photo of the supposed fiancé, she recognized him immediately as my husband. Shocked by this twist of fate, Savannah informed her sister about the upheaval Natalia had caused in my life. Firm in her family values, Savannah considered demanding compensation from Natalia for the trouble caused. Despite the messy situation, Savannah reassured me of her unwavering support and friendship, which we had cherished for over two decades. She had already arranged a meeting with them to address the situation, ensuring that our friendship would not be compromised by these events. Upon my discharge from the hospital, I headed to a pre-arranged meeting at a private restaurant room, accompanied by my lawyer. Thomas and Natalia were already there, indulging in an expensive traditional meal with astonishing nonchalance. Thomas had the audacity to remind me to bring money and pay for their meal. At that moment, fueled by the recent developments and the support of my friend, I decided it was time to assert myself and stand up to Thomas once and for all. I firmly instructed Thomas and Natalia to handle their own bill as I wasn't there to subsidize their lavish meal but to assert my rightful claim over the assets. Ignoring Thomas's disparaging remarks, my lawyer and I settled into our seats and laid out the evidence that demonstrated Thomas's culpability in our marital breakdown. We presented a slew of documents and legal arguments highlighting Thomas's responsibilities and misdeeds in the marriage, alongside detailed plans for the division of property. We also unveiled photographs that Savannah had taken, showing Thomas and Natalia together, as well as Natalia with another man entering a hotel. This evidence visibly unsettled both Thomas and Natalia, halting their dinner abruptly. Savannah chose that exact moment to join us, admitting she was the one who captured those incriminating photos. Natalia was visibly confused and distressed upon seeing her aunt. Savannah explained her presence, expressing her desire to maintain her friendship with me despite demanding reparations from Natalia for her actions, which she condemned as disgraceful. 
Natalia then dropped a bombshell, she claimed to be pregnant. However, Savannah, observing her closely, disputed Natalia's appearance as someone expecting a child. This revelation seemed to shock Thomas as well, and under the weight of the gathered eyes, Natalia crumbled and confessed to lying about the pregnancy. She admitted her strategy had been to target affluent older men, and Thomas had unfortunately been ensnared in her deceit. She revealed that the fabricated pregnancy was a desperate attempt to secure her position as Thomas had shown reluctance to divorce. Thomas was left speechless by these revelations, and before long, Savannah escorted Natalia out of the restaurant for a more private discussion about her actions and the forthcoming apology. Meanwhile, Thomas, now realizing the extent of the deception, pleaded with me to reconsider our relationship, suggesting that as a housewife I couldn't possibly manage without him. I corrected him firmly, disclosing that I had a personal net worth of about $10 million, which would more than suffice for me to live independently and comfortably without him. Thomas, taken aback by this, greedily inquired about a share of my wealth, but I clarified that it was my inheritance and not subject to marital division. Following this encounter, I proceeded with the divorce, ending nearly two decades of marriage. In the aftermath, Natalia compensated me financially, influenced by her mother and Savannah to make amends. Thomas, now estranged by his in-laws, found himself burdened with debts and without his former job, as his escapades with Natalia during work hours had come to light. He resorted to working multiple jobs in construction to manage his financial obligations. I donated a portion of the received compensation to charity and moved to the countryside with the rest, relishing a luxurious single life. Savannah and I continued to strengthen our bond, planning to remain single, share accommodations, and indulge in our love for food and travel. The move to a simpler, joyful life in the countryside was set for the following week, and I looked forward to embracing a future that was authentic and fulfilling, surrounded by true friends like Savannah.